Buongiorno. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, appreciate the invitation to moderate this panel, and I'm pleased to introduce these experts that we're going to be speaking about healthcare emergencies. Uh, we have a diverse set of experts representing the perspective of patient advocates, physicians, hospitals, NGOs. We're here to provide a breadth and depth of perspectives on the issue of healthcare emergencies. We've obviously been tested over the last three years as a result of the global pandemic uh, that leaves us in this posture that we're in now, um, which is the need to be prepared for anything and everything, regardless of how resilient your system is. Uh, many of the conversations that have taken place up to this point uh, are really good tee-ups for the conversation that we're going to have now, uh, whether it's uh, the real crisis that we face with the shortage of frontline healthcare workers, uh, the issues related to patient safety, uh, the threat posed by new pathogens like antimicrobial resistant bacteria. We're really excited to have four experts today. Um, I will quickly introduce them and then I'll let them speak. Uh, Dr. Paul uh, Barak from Thomas Jefferson University in the U.S., not too far from where I'm coming from, is going to be speaking about global readiness. Uh, Anna Slominska from the Polish Diabetes Association will speak about um, caring for a population that's particularly vulnerable um, to the risk of disruption in healthcare, um, speaking about the care of migrants and refugees. Uh, Risto Miotinen from the International Hospital Federation will talk about hospitals and their readiness posture. And then finally, uh, Anna Elisa Barbara from the International Committee of Red Cross will talk about uh, the, very serious, the very serious topic of violence in healthcare. And I'm very excited to be the moderator today. Uh, we'll hopefully have time for questions. My name is Michael Ibarra. I'm an emergency physician in the United States, and I work uh, at Pharma. And we have a perspective to share as well with respect to the medicines that we make, uh, that our members make uh, and provide uh, to patients, regardless of the situation. So with that, I would be uh, excited to turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Paul from Thomas Jefferson University. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here um, to talk about something that uh, I've been interested in and focused on for about 25 years. I'll start, though, that I'm a patient and a cancer survivor. I had a massive adverse event in a top 10 hospital. And so after 15 years of doing research and then being a patient, um, I want to share some thoughts about how patients can be more involved in the design of systems. But let's talk about COVID first and foremost. COVID is actively killing 400 patients a day in the U.S. alone. Um, it's far from over, as Sue alluded to. This is the worst catastrophe since World War II. And it's fair to say that if we look at it as an isolated event, as opposed to the weakness of our systems going into COVID, we've lost an opportunity and a burning platform for change. The graphic on the bottom for all those from the U.S. shows the failing U.S. system. That's how the U.S. is looking this week, actually. That's why that graphic continues to climb. And it suggests that as innovative as we might be in the U.S., our systems have failed us. And that's an important aspect. You might be from a space, a city, a country that's very innovative and productive, but does it actually translate to robust systems? Um, um, and so this is not about COVID, but it's lessons that we can learn from the probably the most important test in our lifetimes. So we know about disasters. They happen all over the world. This is the floods in Pakistan, um, fires and other things. The question is, what can we learn from these things about how do we go forward in healthcare in non-disaster situations, about operational capacities, about security and protection, about issues of access and control? Everything you've heard about in the last day and a half about COVID manifested in the last 30 years in each disaster. So the real question is, why are we so poor at learning the learning health systems that was alluded to by Mundar um, and about Sue, what will it take for us to learn differently about the next disaster? It doesn't matter what you call it. If anything, COVID was so unremarkable, it was predicted in writing 10 years ago. The failure of PPE was predicted in writing 20 years ago. And yet, we know this. None of this is new. What's important and disturbing is that we're not able to internalize the lessons and that relates to patient safety. Hearing Helen's story and Sue's story breaks my heart every time, even though I've heard it now for 20 years, Sue. That was the first time we met, amazingly enough. And yet, we're still having these same incidents and events again and again. Here are tools that we and others around the world have been learning around disasters. We had a blueprint for COVID. And we failed it as a community. We failed it as an organization. We failed it as a world organization coming together. 
So this is the model that we use to analyze complex patient harm and complex system harm. This is a learning system. So you think we're prepared for the next disaster. Do we have in place at the hospital federation, at the medical federation, or us as patients, as consumers, are we actually learning? Are we drawing the right lessons from what happened in the last two or three years? So we have to go back to the most important person in any industry space in the entire world. This guy is the reason why our systems are so much better. Every machine you interact with, every device you use is because of Deming's formulated model 75 years ago about systems. Systems is how you create resilience. Systems are about a reliable way to deliver a product, a service, or healthcare delivery. We haven't really embraced this well enough, including during COVID. So the quadruple aim, you've heard a bit about this, this idea of these tensions between what's good for patients, what's good for staff, what's good for countries, and what's good for corporations. Are those tensions reconcilable? Can we actually have all four of those delivering in the right direction? This is the challenge that clearly in COVID, we know the answer. The answer was, on average, absolutely not. It did not work. We had corporations like vaccines that have been celebrated here, but I would argue that they were dishonest in their marketing, in their science, and they were greedy. They asked to be paid billions before they did their job. I don't want to talk about that, but there are serious issues there about how corporations helped us during COVID. And they're important to talk about that because those tensions are not going to go away. The private public approaches towards diseases and disasters is here to stay. So let's talk about that in, in open and honest transformative tool sets. This is how my colleagues, physicians and nurses, struggle through the pandemic. Were we ready physically, emotionally, and spiritually? The answer is absolutely not. The WHO has reported that over 115,000 115,000 doctors, nurses, and other providers died during the pandemic. Think about that for a moment. There has never been an existential challenge to healthcare providers of that magnitude ever reported earlier, in, or at least in the last 100 years. Imagine the impact on that, on the trust of providers in your countries. The burnout, the moral injury that was talked about yesterday. How do they feel going back to work? This is a data from PAHO, this is a year ago measured as the excess deaths amongst healthcare providers. These are not patients, providers in their daily job, putting their life on the line to save us, to save patients. Notwithstanding all the other harm that we're talking about, these are men and women, doctors, nurses, social workers, and others that are now quitting in droves, including, by the way, hospital managers that in the US are quitting three times faster than before the pandemic. So this moral injury is not just at the staff level, it's at the managerial level as well, and I hope Rista will talk about that as well. I love this, only the Germans, this is, this is yesterday I met Kira from Germany, this is not for you, but only the Germans would, could do and get away with this. These are German doctors and nurses who said, I don't trust PPE. I don't trust it will keep me safe. It's a remarkable story, and it's true. So we've published in multiple studies now, most healthcare providers in the world do not trust PPE. They don't trust it. Not only that, but it's clear that it wasn't suited. We've now been doing five different studies showing that PPE self-contaminated providers because they didn't know how to use it properly. It wasn't well designed for mass use. It was well for a few people for a few minutes, but not for 10 hours a day for millions and millions of providers. Here's a study in which we use transparent solution. We put it on the PPE. We asked people to go through their motions. And we asked them, did you feel that you followed the proper CDC or other guy? They go, yep. Did you contaminate yourself? No. Here's what it looks like with black light. They're all contaminated, 100% of them, 100%. So this is a design problem. This PPE was not designed for purpose, and we need to tell the truth about that. By the way, after Ebola and SARS, it's well published that PPE failed to protect the providers. Failed to protect the providers. So we need to be honest about the limitations of our technologies if we want to create a new trust relationship with providers. We can learn a lot from laboratories that deal with this. This is a laboratory work that I work with in Austria. They ran out of PPE, so the only way they protected their staff was showers. It turns out that showering is a very effective solution when you don't have enough PPE. Reuse of PPE was very dangerous, not recommended, was used around the world, caused a lot of harm. Now, you could say we had no choice. That might be the case, but we were not honest with the providers. We told them that the PPE would protect them, and it didn't protect them. This is an important aspect going forward about trust. 
how much of COVID, was sent, COVID care was centered around patient needs. We've heard a lot about that. You've heard about the harm from CMS, uh, the work from WHO. We need to learn from this incident so that when the next one happens, and it will happen, just like COVID was predicted 10 years ago, it will happen. There's no question about it. Why were some countries so much better than others? I want to call out South Korea amongst others. I was there last week. They are still wearing masks in South Korea. They have one of the lowest infection rates in the entire world. We've decided in the U.S. that the pandemic is over, even though 400 people a day are dying. 400 patients are dying every day from COVID, and the politicians have said the pandemic is over. Again, the dissonance, the lack of trust that ensues from the dissonance between the public messaging and what people feel every day is part of the problem of patient safety. It's harming our ability to work together to tackle these issues. Here's an example. This is the U.S. Uh, uh, congressional reform looking at how poorly the U.S. has done compared to South Korea. About the fifth its size, 1 25th the amount of harm. So why do complex systems fail in spite of good intentions? Why are patients harmed in hospitals, like Helen told us, in spite of good regulations and good intentions? We need to talk about that gap in implementation. Um, so Rochelle Walensky, one of my uh, teachers a long time ago, now head of the CDC, has said the CDC has failed. For the first time, a major leader is saying we, one of the most respected agencies coming into the pandemic has now has one of the worst reputations in the U.S. as a government agency. How did that happen? How did we squander the goodwill? Most people around the world who have heard of the CDC have always held it to be one of the most respectable and integrity organizations, and now it's one of the worst. How could that have happened within two years? A hundred years of goodwill has been squandered by poor leadership, poor governance, and poor accountability. So, Again, the moral distress, this is a, a very important graphic. It was designed 30 years ago about what happens after disasters. First, we all did pots and pans for doctors, which really bothered doctors and nurses. And now we treat them as villains who are accountable for the pandemic, which is a really crazy thing to do right now. So before you point fingers at doctors and nurses and patient safety, think about the systems they work in. Think about the failed systems that set them up for failure not just the patients that are cared for by them. So how do we um, use these models for designing for disaster patient-facing tools? We have models. We have tools to do so. The question is, are we willing to do true co-production? Carson just talked about that. We've developed an EMR in which patients were invited to design their system. And it turns out that the providers like that system better than their own system. So think about the co-design of leaning in to everything you interact with and being more accountable for your care. That does not in any way absolve providers for their responsibility. It invites patients and families to step into the breach because it's a massive breach, as you've heard in the last two days. So co-production, co-design, this is Paul Batalden's work, this idea that it's designed around the microsystem, the team of people that care for you, either in the hospital or the community, how are they accountable to each other, what holds them together, how do we build better organizational frameworks to help them help you um, and be more accountable to, in the fiduciary way. I love this work by Khan. Look at this model of healthcare redesign. Look at the heart of it. It's not about anything but values. What are the values of healthcare providers and systems as we go forward in protecting patients, in supporting their families, in creating networks of trust? And I believe you can measure trust. You can do entrustment activities. We've talked about that in medical education for about 15 years now. How do we bring more trust back to the conversation? This is the WHO model that I've been working with. It's called the Sendai framework. It's a fascinating framework for disaster thinking. Uh, it's been around for about five years now. Strangely enough, it's been divorced from the patient safety work, even at WHO, which is really quite interesting. And, and uh, I've had some conversations here with Kira and others. How organizations design themselves is about how they envision the wisdom coming out of them. So inside WHO, there's an incredible group focusing on disasters, which has mimicked the work in patient safety, Mundar, but has been separated from it. So again, how do we bring this wisdom together in a more proactive way? How do we bring more learning health systems using participatory governance, as you heard from the WHO yesterday, in a way that drives more local control 
more local agency, more local accountability. Um, so Alan Delany, uh, a Swedish uh, architect, has talked about how do we rethink the system because we have to talk about system models that doesn't ignore the importance of individuals. It talks about a different way to frame the problems, the structures, the language of structure building to make sure that we have the tools in a way that creates more value. So again, COVID is a great opportunity to think about our buildings, our hospital structures, our community structure, and the tools we use to assess, to learn, and engage people more fully, more meaningfully, to use Viktor Frankl's work, the meaning of the work that we do. One of the reasons I think that so many providers are quitting is because they feel that they can't go to work in open eyes anymore because they feel that they were not told the truth they feel the system didn't trust them, and they have lost faith in the system. This is not about money, as Risto said yesterday. It's about much more than money. It's very easy to blame these problems on budgets, and I think that's an intellectual cowardice to do so. Sure, we could use more money, but it's about how we use the money that we have already, and there's a lot of money in healthcare that's not being used in a proper way. So some thoughts as I wrap up here. What do we mean by value in healthcare? How do we translate that value into language that makes sense to people? as it relates to implementation of the ideas that we've heard about today, and how do we talk about the public health entities? We've not really talked about the public health resources. We talk about health and we talk about hospitals. We don't really talk about this other network, which are the public health leaders that Marta spoke about yesterday, the World Federation of Public Health Societies. They have a lot of resources, but they're not necessarily acknowledged or invited to the table. So again, after action, do we have the courage to ask ourselves, could we have done better in managing the COVID pandemic, the ongoing COVID pandemic, yes? Are we able and willing to ask those tough questions and follow the data, not just the polemics of politicians? Um, the other question is, we know we have models for assessing disaster readiness. We've known about them for 30 years. There is nothing new about that, but having the courage and the political will to follow the data and allow that to drive our next preparedness is really where we need to go. Again, the context, the culture is what's important. While we come from different countries and have very different tools, we have to make sure to localize our tools because what works in Finland or Sweden or the US might not work in other places. And, and being able to acknowledge that difference is quite important. John Cotter's work about this idea, are we ready? Are we ready to make hospitals safer? Are we ready to make our communities more in control of their care? Do we have the language and tools and courage to go there? And can we talk about it out loud? Are we afraid to talk about these things because we might be punished politically, socially, or culturally in our various places? In wrapping up, the timescales are harsh. Some of these things are going to take five to 10 years. Do we have the time and patience to wait for that? Obviously not. So this is really important, this relationship between services, technology, and infrastructure. How does the human spirit fit within that, that space? And more importantly, are we ready for the moral conundrums? This powerful book about what happened in New York City, that some patients had to be let to die, as we do in wars, because one of the hardest things in triage is deciding who should live. And it's terrible to be that nurse who had to make the call because they realized that there was nobody else that was going to call the family. So they felt that moral burden of being the bridge between the isolated loved one and, and, and their families. Imagine how people feel the terrible toll that they took upon themselves in dealing with that death and destruction, that despair that burrows into their soul and ultimately leads to that moral injury and early resignation. So I want to wrap up with this idea that comes from Carl Weick originally, which is as much as we want to build tools and structures and all the rest, it's about the culture. Peter Senge's work about the culture eats everything. So unless we deal with the culture of safety in hospitals, all the stuff we've talked about will only help at the margins. And we have tools for measuring culture. We have tools for implementing trust. We have tools for holding people to account. So this is a question of political will. It's not a question of money or science. It's a question of political will. So in, in my true final slide, these are the principles of 25 years of work of my team and others. And as we think about the role of engaging patients more fully, more truthfully, more transparently, more trusting, we have to be thinking about the social science aspects of patient safety, not just the technology. These are the stuff that are harder to measure, they're more malleable, they're more culturally sensitive. 
And I want to just uh, use an analogy. My favorite architect, Risto, is uh, Alvaro Alto, a very famous Finnish architect, who really annoyed some of his clients because he would never finish the building until he saw the people who used the building use the building because he said, it's only through their work in using the building that I'll know when the building is complete. True co-production, but it pissed off his clients to the nth degree because they wanted a beautiful building. He was like, no, 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 I want to see how the users are going to use my building. He had the humility to realize that even as a, a, a super architect, he didn't really understand what the users would do until the users used his building. That's the measure of co-production, co-design, with trust, transparency, and truth-telling. I want to end with this. This is a collaboration in Europe, uh, 18 countries, um, called Credo, and then this thing we talk about working together to build better disaster and readiness tools across Europe. You can see some of the countries here. Um, the framework is about building collaborations with patients and patient organizations to be better prepared for disasters and emergencies, and using this learning in an effective way, we'll be putting in a grant to the European Union at the end of November. If you're interested in participating, please uh, reach out to me and I'd love to talk more about this uh, in the, the world question of answer. health emergency. Thank you disaster. so much. Oh, um, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, I'd like to now introduce Anna Slowinska uh, to speak from the Polish Diabetes Association about migrants and refugees in healthcare emergencies. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day, I think, for many of us. Uh, today, I would like to speak about migrants and refugees healthcare in emergencies. And the experience for me is very fresh because, as you might have heard, Poland, which is a country I live in, uh, is a place which hosts very many migrants and refugees from Ukraine. So, war in Ukraine started on the 24th of February, and it's been a huge disaster, as most of you know, and, and very unfortunate event for the people involved. So, from the very beginning, it's been a huge challenge to help those who stayed in the war-torn country, as well as those who fled the country. And in Poland, there have been between 1 million and 4 million <coughs> refugees at any given time. Uh, in total, 7 million Ukrainians crossed the border with Poland, but, of course, very many of them also uh, traveled further to, to other countries. So, as the Polish Diabetes Association, which is one of the biggest and oldest patients associations in Poland, uh, since we take care of diabetics, it's the most natural for us to, of course, try to help Ukrainian diabetics. So how did we cope with that? From the very beginning of the war, we were in touch, or we are still in touch, with International Diabetes Federation and Ukrainian Diabetes Federations, because it's very important to understand what the people need um, so that we know what the situation looks like, and to what are the needs, because a lot of people who just wanted to help, they tried to guess what people might need, both those who stayed in Ukraine and those who fled. But it's very important actually to ask them, because they are the ones, to tell, they are the ones who can tell us what they need. Also, we have been organizing foreign aid, because there have been a lot of people and institutions in other countries who wanted to help Ukrainian diabetics, but they didn't really know how to do it. So since they've heard that Poland is the country which is very much involved in helping them, they felt that maybe it would be easier if they transfer help to Poland and also to the Polish Diabetes Association, and they trust us that we will distribute help as it is needed, or that we will transfer help to Ukraine, which of course we do. So we've been doing that a lot. Also, our association has been approaching pharmaceutical and medical, medical companies for financial and material support. Of course, a lot of companies were and are still very much willing to provide support, but some of them need to be encouraged 
and some of them also ask what is needed so that they can provide the help that is really needed. And that's what we do. We always encourage them to donate as much finances or resources as they can. So, uh, from the very beginning of the war, of course, insulin and other medications have been a huge problem in Ukraine. Insulin is a drug which is a, a life-saving drug, even though technically it's not a drug, it's a hormone, but it's called a life-saving drug. And people who are insulin dependent, they cannot live without insulin. And as the Polish Diabetes Association, we have very much tried and wanted to help with insulin and medications. However, in Poland, those can only be donated through government strategic reserve agency. And even though our association was able to help at the, very, at the worst point at the beginning of the war, but still we were not allowed to do it because, of course, uh, medications need special storage and transport conditions. And th even though technically we could provide those, we were not allowed. We asked the government even to be granted a very temporarily status uh, that would enable us to do it, but we, no, we, it was refused. So we could not do it. So what we could do, we could intervene at the Ministry of Health and with in insulin manufacturers that they donate as much insulin and medications as possible. And this, uh, with the Ministry of Health, of course, was very much willing to help, and the insulin manufacturers were also very much willing to help, but still it did require some interventions and some encouragement. However, there have been problems with distribution of medications in Ukraine because, of course, it, there is war in the country, and it's sometimes impossible to, to transport medications to all the places. Because, as you can imagine, if there is no food or water in some city or town, then even the more there are no medications. So uh, the Polish Ministry of Health, the Polish government, is only allowed to trans transport medications to the nearest biggest city in Ukraine, which is called Lviv. And in Lviv, they have very big storage places. And from there, Ukrainians have to distribute medications by themselves. That's how it works. We cannot change it. And unfortunately, at some point, we probably had to accept that we will not be able to reach every single town with our help. So helping refugees in Poland. Um, the Polish Diabetes Association is, as I said, a very big association. We have about 330 regional branches, which really is a lot. And quite a few of them engaged in helping refugees locally. So thanks to the help from our sponsors, we've been able to create special help centers. A company called Medtronic donated $50,000, thanks to which we've been able to uh, buy medications for Ukrainian refugees. Of course, these are mostly diabetes medications, but also other medications. Uh, the company Abbott donated 1,500 freestyle Libra sensors, and these are special sensors for continuous blood glucose monitoring. And these are very, very useful. People don't have to prick their fingers many times a day. These are sensors that are attached to the arm of the patient and they constantly monitor uh, blood glucose levels. So we've been distributing those. Also, we received a grant of $100,000 from an American humanitarian organization called Direct Relief. Um, and from, those, uh, uh, the, from the money, we bought vouchers, pharmacy vouchers and grocery store vouchers. Uh, which are distributed among Ukrainian refugees and are also very, very helpful tools. It really helps them. And I have to say that our regional branches of, of our association have been excellent in distributing that help around the country, as well as simply helping refugees with everyday things, because, of course, when people come to get financial support, they also ask a lot of questions about the healthcare system or about any other, any, anything possible because, you know, some things are difficult in your own country and 
not to mention in a foreign country where you don't quite know the language or customs or whatever. So our people have been excellent with providing um, all kinds of support. And throughout that time, we've been receiving a lot of requests from individuals and from institutions, uh, both refugees and those who remained in Ukraine. So as you can imagine, we've been receiving so many requests every single day, people, institutions asking, begging for all kinds of help, which has been, has been very, very difficult, very time consuming. But of course, we try to answer every single request if we only can, we, we try to help. If we cannot help, we at least we, we contact those people so that they know that there is someone who cares about them. Also, it's very important to exchange experiences and information with other non-governmental organizations. Because uh, you know how it is that sometimes other organizations um, or in, within different organizations, we sometimes compete it's a bit of a competition, who can do what, who can do uh, more, who can do better. But in a situation like this, there should be absolutely no competition and we should cooperate and exchange experiences because if somebody, if, if a different organization knows how to help, then we can actually ask them, they should tell us. If we know how to help, we also have to tell them. So in a situations like this, forget about competition, forget boasting on Facebook, you know, I did this, I did that, I did better. No, we must not, never do this in situations of crisis. So I hope uh, thank you for your attention, and I very much hope that the war in Ukraine is going to end as soon as possible so that the people will be able to return to their countries. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was excellent. I couldn't agree more. Um, I would like to now turn it to Risto to speak about our hospitals ready for healthcare emergencies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, by the way, I would like to acknowledge Norma Christina Bock, who is behind all this. She's done a lot of great work to make this happen. So, so to start with, um, having listened to all the presentations so far, uh, as a former hospital CEO, I feel like one of the bad guys, really. Uh, but it's just the opposite. You know, hospitals and health systems are for patients. And I, I will come back to that. that. That's an important message I, I would like to give here. And, and uh, talking about hospitals, actually, uh, I think we are wrong in thinking about hospitals alone because we should think, like Paul said, in the systems level. And, and it's very important. So before we start, I, I just would like to uh, go back a, a couple of uh, presentations. Uh, you remember Karsten Engel being online, uh, presenting from ISQA. Uh, we're collaborating very, have, very deeply with, with ISQA. Uh, you may have noticed that, that in Karsten's slide, uh, he's in Australia, Brisbane, because they, they will have their uh, World Conference starting tomorrow. So uh, I would say we live in a truly global network. So, so Karsten's a very good friend and colleague of mine. We're going to meet the World Hospital Congress in Dubai in three weeks. So, so this, this is the context. So, and, and by the way, I, I agree very much with, with this presentation. So in addition to, to representing the International Hospital Federation, being an emeritus CEO, I, I just retired uh, late last year, as a university hospital CEO, I'm lecturing at the University of Colorado, Denver, for an executive MBA class on international health, also lecturing at the University of Eastern Finland. So these are my disclosures. But now, coming back to the systems, uh, this slide is more than 10 years old. It's from a Finnish institution. And we're actually implementing this, this kind of a, a change now, now uh, integrating health and social services in, in Finland. But I'm not going to talk about that. The, the main message here, and uh, even though the picture is more than 10 years old, it's still valid. 
is that hospitals are no isolates, not working uh, in separation from the community. Hospitals are part of the community, uh, doing their job, but very dependent on, on the uh, needs of the population, all other kinds of services. So, so we talk about health service networks here. Uh, you, you have various terms to describe it. You can talk about health systems. But still, it's important to understand that hospitals do not work in isolation. And, and uh, I believe that uh, worldwide, uh, now having seen that in the International Hospital Federation, it's moving into that direction. So uh, we've heard quite a lot uh, about COVID. I'm not going to go into these details, uh, and, and we, we all have seen that. This is just an example of, of a disaster or emergency. And, and the main uh, message here uh, to be seen is the fact that the pre-COVID situation there was already considerable variation between countries in, in access to health care, in, in uh, the uh, ratings by, by patients, how satisfied they are with their services. So, so uh, a huge difference. And what's been, we don't have this exact statistics yet uh, for uh, after COVID because we're still in it. But you can see on the right hand side the, the immediate effect of the COVID pandemic. So, so we have uh, heard about that and, and uh, it's just my presumption is that, that when we start from a situation where country by country there is great variation in patient satisfaction, in access to care, this probably has just gone worse. Uh, but this slide is also to uh, tell you about the OECD, the Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. We heard a lot about WHO and, and statistics coming from there, and OECD are not health specialists, as I said, economic, but still uh, they produce highly reliable data around healthcare. So, so this, this information is, is from their uh, so-called health at a glance uh, documentation. It, its uh, last version is from last year. You can find a lot of information, reliable information on healthcare from OECD, just to mention. So, hospitals are facing all kinds of disasters. And, and uh, now uh, my topic is not about COVID. It, it's about the other situations, we've had wildfires. Think about California, Australia. Uh, we had floodings, uh, we saw an example of that, and, and uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, um, all different kinds of, of things that, that are probably related to climate change. Not only because we, we have had disasters before, but, but still it, it's been increasing. So hospitals are facing all this uh, possible events, and, and COVID has been the extreme example on that. But now, maybe the second takeaway message from me would be the fact that uh, hospitals and health systems are impacted just as well as the population and, and patients. So we heard about staff shortages, we heard about the problems, uh, we, we are talking about trust and leadership and culture, which is really at the center point. It's not administration as the normal mindset would go. We, we are uh, in need of, of preparing hospitals and understanding that. That first message, we are living in a network, part of the society. It, it's systems level thinking. Secondly, uh, with all these things happening, it, it's not like a factory producing something for, for uh, customers. It, it's much more. And uh, this statement from the WHO in the middle is, is uh, slightly pessimistic in the way that, that uh, no country has actually been well prepared. And, and this is the first estimate I've, I've seen in, in their recent health statistic report this year. And work is going on. There will be more information. But I, I think this supports quite a lot of what we've heard so far already. It, it's, it's been a, a real disaster and, and uh, the systems have not quite been able to respond to that. And uh, 
in conclusion with what I said, that, that hospital health systems are part of the society, is that things like war in Ukraine, uh, we, we see a lot of violence against hospitals. Uh, we, we have seen in, in other situations as well that uh, even in, without a crisis, the uh, culture has been changing in that healthcare workers are at risk of violence. We, we have conducted a, a joint study on that, but Anna will continue. I will not touch that further, so violence will be in the next topic. And the role of the International Hospital Federation is really to support health systems. We love the name International Hospital Federation because we've been established back in 1929. We are almost 100 years old, so we don't want to change that name. But it's really about health systems. So uh, I mentioned we're going to have the World Hospital Congress in, in Dubai in three weeks from now. And uh, shortage of staff will be the main concern, absolutely. And this is just an example of the agenda. Uh, we are working uh, quite intensively with, with the American College of Healthcare Executives as well on that and other national organizations. So uh, IHF is an umbrella organization of, uh, inter of uh, national hospital associations and, and uh, uh, so we don't have individual members, it's hospitals and associations as members. But we've heard so much about staff shortage and the problems behind that and, and culture, leadership, how to attract and retain people. Uh, I just uh, want to invite, if you are able to join us in Dubai in three weeks, to, to, to be part of this discussion. So this, this has been recognized by hospitals, truly recognized as a first priority. And this is a global thing that, that really uh, we don't have enough staff. And it's not only nurses. Allied staff, doctors, and all other co-workers in the field. That this is the issue, and I think that's the most critical part. So to end with, uh, this picture is from my old hospital, it's the University Hospital in Kuopio, Finland, and shows very nicely what I said in the beginning. Uh, hospitals and health systems are for patients. And this image shows quite nicely as well that it's not only the child in center, but there's a mother and a sister, and, and you have to take into account uh, the whole context. And the doctor here is for them. So uh, this is our vision, and, and that's what I represent. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, I agree. There doesn't, uh, your, your tee up was perfect. There doesn't need to be any bad guys. Everyone has a role to play, uh, particularly when we all collaborate and we can identify the problem, which is why this is a great session to be able to, to talk about all of these issues. Pleased to introduce our final speaker, and I hopefully, I think we will have time for questions, which is great. Anna Elisa Barber from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you. They will put the time right there on the. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Almost end of morning. I hope it's not too boring, but we're going to finish this quickly. Uh, this last topic uh, connects a lot to what we've been discussing in the past day and also today. I think there were some mentions throughout the, the other presentations. But just to, to put everyone in the same page, where am I speaking from? So I don't know if all of you are acquainted to the ICRC, to the International Committee of the Red Cross. So it's an organization, an independent uh, humanitarian organization that has its mission to assist and protect victims of conflict and other situations of violence. That means we have a specific mandate to work in war or in situations where violence goes up to the threshold of the humanitarian consequences of conflict. And it's almost twice as old as the UN itself, as the United Nations, so we are the oldest humanitarian organization in the world. We're present in over 80 countries in the world, and we have a, a budget yearly of over 2 billion uh, Swiss francs, so it's quite a big organization. But we have this mandate, and we do try to address issues that come from this environment, but that talk to others too, and this is a little bit what I'm gonna do here. 
Um, we do have this initiative that is the last point there. Uh, it's called the Healthcare in Danger Initiative uh, that was meant to do exactly that. So how we speak about violence against healthcare, which is something we see in war very often, sadly, but that we want to talk to others about that. So this is a little bit uh, where I'm coming from, from this initiative within uh, the ICRC, and, and trying to speak to you to also see if it makes sense, if it resonates to you, and how it relates to the reality of healthcare uh, that we see nowadays. So what is violence against healthcare, this problem that we're talking about? This definition doesn't come from us, it comes from the World Health Organization, and it means that any act of verbal or physical violence or any act of obstruction or any act of threat of violence that interferes with availability, access and delivery of healthcare is violence. That means it, we, can, we can look at a spectrum from interpersonal violence that happens, for example, when a patient or a family member or a healthcare worker disagrees with another person within the, the environment of provision of care, up to bombing of a hospital for example. It's the whole spectrum that is called violence against healthcare. And of course, uh, you see there the, oh, thank you. <laughs> you see the, the, the spectrum there. But we're talking about three types of victims of these types uh, of acts. The patients, the health workers, and the family members who are with these uh, patients at the, the environment of care. The service itself, so the material resources, the structures. And at a broader level, at the systemic level, we talk about the system, so the access to healthcare and the availability of services as also being a victim of this type of violence. And why this is a problem? So, of course, I don't think it's a novelty for any of us to think that violence is a problem in any condition, but being objective about it, why is this a problem for us working and discussing what happens within healthcare systems. Well, first of all, you have the human cost, so you might lose lives, you might have impact on, on the physical and mental health of people who are affected by violence. Uh, the health workers themselves might be less available to work. The patients themselves might start fearing to access the services, and this is very well documented that, for example, in um, places in conflict, uh, women fear going to healthcare facilities to deliver. That is, the, the rates of delivery at home, they go back when conflict starts because women fear the displacement and or being targeted uh, within a health facility. Then you have the loss of material assets needed for healthcare. I think Anna, the other Anna, the Anna from the Polish Diabetes Association touched a little bit upon that, how logistics uh, become more complicated also. Uh, you have the reduction of capacity of services, loss of trust, and of course, increased costs for the services. And again, we don't want to scale that in terms of importance. I think all of these um, all of these elements are very important. It depends on the interlocutor and who we're thinking together about this problem. But I would say that the humanity behind it, the fact that we have been accepting and normalizing violence within healthcare and against healthcare says a lot about how negligent we have been about this problem. So we cannot keep on avoiding on touching in, in this in subjects. So what we can do about it concretely? Um, and this, and I, I'm gonna just take a little uh, break from, from the slide and, and tell you that I'm not here talking exclusively about Yemen or Syria or Ethiopia or Ukraine, where we can see headlines about a hospital being attacked or health workers being kidnapped. I'm talking about every single country, and just to give you a small number, when COVID started, when the pandemic started, in the first 10 months, we decided to monitor just through media scanning, so we didn't do any kind of like active reaching out to people. We were just monitoring media to see whether COVID and the pandemic would have an impact on violence against healthcare. And in the first eight months, there were 300 attacks, and by attack, we don't mean just interpersonal violence, you know, the arguments or some degree of physical violence because of a small disagreement. We mean premeditated violence against some aspect of the healthcare provision and attack. That's what we mean. There were 300 attacks in 10 months in high-income countries. 
So I'm just giving you the data of high-income countries. That is, uh, COVID centers being destroyed, a bomb being placed inside a testing center in a country in Europe, um, people getting attacked in the streets, uh, especially health workers who were allegedly spreading the virus, patients being prevented, patients with symptoms being prevented to reach a healthcare facility because people thought that this displacement was also putting them in harm. So this is a reality for all of us. And then going back to the, the study that Risto just mentioned, so the ICRC, my organization, with his organization, the International Hospital Federation, and also the International Council of Nurses and the World Medical Association, we did a study for COVID specifically and we saw the impact of violence in the COVID response itself. So we can say that violence against healthcare did have an impact in lives and in effectiveness and in costs for the, the COVID response. So it's that serious. So go back, going back to what we can do about it. So first of all, we can mobilize people about the problem. We have to have this conversation. And I'm saying this with confidence of someone who has been working for almost a decade strictly on this topic. We don't talk enough about it. And uh, this can be touched in, in round tables about uh, patient safety, for example, when you're talking about what can do harm within a hospital environment. We can talk um, about this when we're talking about disaster preparedness or emergency preparedness like we're doing in this, in this panel today. But we can also talk about it when we're talking about the experience of patients within the healthcare system because they will tell often that they are disagreeing, they're frustrated, this becomes a tension within the, the, the hospital setting, and that goes back to the ideas of how we generate accountability to make sure that people are not resorting to other types of um, conflict-solving mechanisms that are not uh, helpful uh, within the healthcare environment. So we, we have to have this conversation. Then we have to report and advocate for justice. Also because most of the healthcare environments, from primary healthcare up to super specialized hospitals, they don't have mechanisms to report on violence. So if you're a patient and someone was violent against you within a healthcare uh, environment, a healthcare setting, please ask around and see if there's a mechanism to report violence. Most of the places don't have that. They would just say, oh, you have to talk to the police. And well, maybe the police is not the right actor also to address every single problem of violence or tension that is going on in that setting. Thirdly, engage in multidisciplinary action. So it's not just the healthcare stakeholders alone that would solve this, but of course we would need to talk more broadly with society and see what needs to be done. I'm giving you a good example of Italy, for example. Because of COVID and because of the degree of attacks against COVID responders in Italy, they passed a law to criminalize that type of attack. So it's not anymore just interpersonal, interpersonal violence. Here in Italy, if you commit an act of violence against a healthcare worker, it has a higher threshold within the judicial system. Again, this is not a single solution. It doesn't fit every type of violence and it doesn't respond to all the needs, but we have to work sometimes with other um, dimensions of, of the problem and other stakeholders in society to address it correctly. And finally, please use your voice to inform about fears, about needs, about concerns, and about risks mainly. And when I talk about risks, not just risks within the healthcare setting, like within the hospital or within the health center where you're receiving care, but also on your way there. Is it a problem for you as a patient to access healthcare that you have to pass through extremely uh, insecure environments? Is this hampering your capacity to access your um, treatment or your follow-up? This is something that has to be discussed and included also uh, in, in the exchanges that patients have with the healthcare provider so that they can be reactive to that and they can think through what can be done. I'm happy to say that the World Patients Alliance is engaged with the, the Healthcare in Danger Initiative, this, this global initiative to, to talk about uh, uh, violence against healthcare, but we do need to take it down and make sure that all uh, 
stakeholders that are also globally engaged with the World Patients uh, Alliance, they're also understanding the problem and they're also talking about it. So we appreciate the space that you're giving uh, to the ICRC to be able to, to share these concerns with you today. So thank you so much. I hope we can discuss it later. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And another round of applause because everyone stayed on time and we have time for questions. So great work. Nice job. Um, so uh, I would like to start with a uh, question. Do we have a microphone? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe I'll, I will hand this to you first and then you can pass it down. Um, there, was a, there was a slide that you showed, Paul, about a, a book and then subsequently a show uh, that was in the U.S. called Five Days at Memorial. Uh, if you have not heard about it, it's about Memorial Hospital, which is in um, New Orleans during the time of Hurricane Katrina, which was a major um, natural disaster in the U.S. And the interesting, uh, m many interesting aspects to the book, um, but one of the most interesting to me was um, that there was preparation for a hurricane, but there was not the preparation for what happened after the hurricane, which was the breach of the levees in New Orleans that led to the town to flood, the hospital to be cut off from the world. And each of you touched on something that made me think of that, and maybe starting with you, Paul, um, you know, the hospital collapsed, um, patients missed their medicines, um, there was violence against healthcare workers and people in the community, uh, but at the end of the Day, there was no plan for the second disaster, which was the breach of the levees. Um, so, you know, something that you talked a lot about, Paul, um, that maybe you could touch upon is, you know, how do we build communities' resilience for the things that we um, maybe can't see, that we don't see coming around the corner? You talked about a lot that we do see, but what about what we don't see? Um, I hate to start by quoting Mike Tyson, but Mike Tyson, the boxer, says, everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face. Um, and while it sounds crude, um, what's remarkable about disasters is that there's always an aftermath of the primary disaster. Mm. Um, as a former military person, we, we say we do a lot of work in planning, but we know up front that our plan will never be executed according to the mm. plan. And so, you know, I, I was uh, in Miami uh, as, a, as a chief of quality uh, during Katrina. Katrina hit Miami before it hit New Orleans. And most of the hospitals in Miami, Risto, had their generators in the basement then. Mm -hmm. Now, if you live in a place that floods on a regular basis, why would you put your generators in the basement? But that was the standard up until Katrina in the U.S. Yeah. You know, it wasn't particularly rocket science that when it flooded, of course, the hospital would lose mm -hmm. its power. And I think, um, you know, what we learned from New Orleans was a, was a cataclysmic failure of decision making 10 years earlier that manifested in people trying to survive and ultimately the patients, the staff, oh, by the way, all the pets that also died there yes, yeah. um, who were totally ignored because mm. they told people, leave your pets behind. And, and I don't know, by show of hands, if you're told to evacuate, would you leave your pets behind? Honestly now, just by show of hands. And yet, that's what we tell people. So obviously, a lot of people stayed behind and died trying to protect their pets. So nobody actually thought about the lived experience of people that spend more time and energy with their pets sometimes than with their kids. And so it's an example of not having realistic planning for that um, and the, the difficult moral questions that staff have to do. For example, Absolutely. what do you do when you have to evacuate patients on the 10th floor from an ICU and you have to take them down 10 stories? Um, these are very difficult questions, and they're difficult questions that, you know, the only place that's real deals with this is the military and triage, mm -hmm. where there's an actual science, if you will, of what do you do when you have to make choices between who will survive and who will not. It's never easy, but there is a knowledge base around it. And so I think we have to think about disasters as dynamic disaster management. Mm -hmm. And that means that there'll be multiple continuity disasters and we have to have the ability to have resources in hold. Yeah. For example, having the staff awake all day for the first day or two seems like a good plan, except it's really bad for day three, four, and five. And so how do you actually think about a rolling disaster? And we have called COVID essentially a slow rolling disaster and not having the preparedness after the first few days or weeks to deal with the consequences. For example, mm -hmm. suddenly staff are ill. Or for example, what happens when staff members' families are ill and the staff members stay home? We hadn't thought about that enough. What do you do when the transport pathways are blocked? And so, for example, we had bicycles available at the hospital so that when the roads are blocked, 
people could get back and home. These are the types of things that in COVID we learn staff that wouldn't go home because they didn't want to contaminate people. In some cities, immediately hotels opened up for staff members. Other countries, people had to fend in their own regard and pay out of pocket. And so thinking about these types of issues requires a whole different level of planning. In fact, it requires everyday planning. So right. instead of thinking about the disaster as a black swan, think about it as a white swan that mm -hmm. happens every day, but slowly. Right. And that's a very different way to prepare for our next uh, pandemic disaster. That makes sense. Thank you. And that, I think, um, you know, the issue of uh, um, sort of, you know, how do we... Well, let me back up. When I saw that movie, it made me very concerned about working in the next snowstorm that we get in Washington, D.C. I've been working throughout the pandemic, but I thought, you know, this is, uh, you're absolutely right. How do we continue to encourage people to show up to, to work when they're on the verge of this, this uh, kind of slow burning disaster? Which I kind of want to pivot over to uh, Risto, your question or your comments um, related to maintaining a uh, sufficient workforce. How do we, um, how, what do we do to increase the workforce, make sure that we can maintain and attract folks to work in a hospital setting? And sort of connected to that, if I could bring in Anna as well to talk about how violence might be also sort of um, pushing healthcare workers to retire earlier to, to change uh, professions within healthcare. I'll start with you, Risto, if that's okay. Thank you. So obviously, this all conditions matter, and, and, and it's, it's partly about money, but as I mm -hmm. said, not, not only about money. And, and when we talk about leadership and culture, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, just as an example, I, I just like, like to take Ukraine. I mean, they've been brutally attacked with, without being ready for that. And, and uh, I think that President Zelensky is showing true leadership in mm -hmm. that. He's not a specialist. He's an actor and comedian, mm -hmm. but, but still he's leading the country. Yeah. And why I'm taking this example is actually out of... Uh, our own experience in Finland, because Finland was attacked in a very similar way back in 1939 by the Soviet Union at that time, and, and we managed to keep our independence. And, and, and so, so um, coming from that experience, I, I think that is a true example of leadership, and, and it, it requires so many aspects in, in attracting, maintaining people. And Well, I quoted uh, mm -hmm. Sir Richard Branson yesterday about uh, customers not being first, but, but the staff. He's also said that you have to have fun at work. Mm -hmm. And I, I think yeah. that, that's a great statement. So you obviously see that I'm a great fan of, of Richard. Yeah. So uh, we're talking about leadership, and it's, it's not necessarily the, the best professional who's the best leader. Yeah, that's a great example. And what about, um, from your perspective, Anna, just in terms of violence and what we're seeing with healthcare worker trends, is it contributing to folks to burn out that we, what we say in the United States or causing people to leave? How is that impacting workforce issues? Yeah, so that is also well documented that um, burnout due to, to violence mm -hmm. is a problem nowadays in healthcare. There is, uh, in the US itself, there is a new act being pushed mm -hmm. forward by the Senate to make sure that healthcare workers are more protected in that sense. But I, I would say that this is not different uh, elsewhere, and especially health workers faced with emergency response, mm -hmm. which is something that typically they're not mm -hmm. prepared to. Uh, but I would just, I wanted to, to say something related to, to the whole, uh, to the first question about emergency preparedness and how it uh, was still said in terms of leadership and coming back to, to the idea of like how we motivate, if we can use this word, as health workers. So first, uh, the first thing for me is that when we look at emergency preparedness and how you construct this idea of emergency preparedness, this has to be something that indeed takes up on the idea that an, in, within an emergency response, you're not going to be able to respond to everything, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have to cut somewhere. But these ideas of how, how you manage a limitation of resources or how you manage adverse conditions, this has to include an open conversation, a transparent conversation with all stakeholders from the beginning. So also, even the idea of triage, as, as Paul was mentioning, this is not something that we can take up as health workers thinking about emergency solely as a response to something that was never thought about before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to make sure, for example, that the idea of why triage is being done and what are the criteria that are being set, set up, they're being discussed and communicated with the community 
community that is going to receive these protocols at a certain point if that is ever triggered by an emergency, right? So there's a whole mindset about emergency preparedness that helps this idea of motivation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even to face adverse conditions from the health workers and from the community from patients, from family members, that will eventually also be suffering those adverse conditions in a way or another. So yes, some cuts will be needed. People will face a, a bigger degree of stress than what they would normally be expected. You cannot function in normal flow within an emergency, but the more you prepare to it in a transparent and communicated way, the better everyone will be resilient to that crisis and to the aftermath also. So. Great points, really great points. Resiliency is, is so important. And I also think too, um, you know, it's, it's so much more likely to impact those that are at the bottom of the totem pole within the healthcare workforce. Uh, as a physician, as a team leader, I have more bandwidth to, to take on um, in some situations, but you know, my residents or the medical students that are victims of violence, it's a huge, uh, huge impact on their lives. They don't have as much time off. That's a very simple, uh, simple example, but the resilience aspect and, and building up capacity um, is really, you have to look at it from all angles. Um, would love to bring you in, Anna, as well, for a question. Um, uh, again, so appreciate your comments at the end. We all share uh, our hopes um, for, for peace soon. Um, are there any best practices that you would like to sort of describe that you saw? You talked about amazing things happening from your chapters. Um, are there any best practices or things that you want folks here to take away um, that we can do to, to help? Um, I think uh, I've already said that in my presentation that uh, we have to exchange experience and accept that there might be some other organizations with whom on everyday basis we might compete. Mm -hmm. But in that situation we must exchange experience and mm -hmm. uh, tell them how to do things or ask them how to do things. Mm -hmm. So this is crucial. Um, and also that we have to ask the people who are uh, affected by the situation uh, what they need. Because in Poland it was at the very beginning people who really wanted to help. They, uh, they brought uh, everything they mm -hmm. possibly could to refugee centers mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of things got actually wasted because there was just too much of this or that. So it's very important to actually ask those people what they need, to ask people who take care of those people what they need, and also to be in touch with those who stayed in, in a war-torn country, if possible, of course, because if it's not possible, then, you know, if there's no food, no, no mm -hmm. drink, no medications, no internet, no telephones, nothing, then, you know, you, can, you, you just cannot be in touch with those people, of course. Right. Right, right. Yeah, I know that makes sense. You need to sort of assess what is helpful. And sometimes, uh, you know, your own ideas may not line up with what is actually needed. So great points. Um, well, I think we are back on time. Uh, we are right at the 1130 break. Um, I want to thank the panelists for excellent job presenting on a wide variety of, of topics, but um, they all married together really, really nicely. So um, I think we're going on break now, but one final round of applause for the Healthcare Emergencies panel. <laughs> <laughs>